Good morning and welcome to Virtual Church here at PCMK. Today's a special day in the life of our church. It is the last Sunday in January, so it that means it is time for our annual meeting. Normally we would hold it in our sanctuary immediately after worship, but today we will hold it over Zoom at that same time, 11 a.m. The Zoom link to join the meeting is in the email that sent you this virtual church video. You will enjoy the fellowship of seeing one another's faces and we will conduct the annual business of the church, hear a report on the budget, elect new officers, and approve the pastor's terms of call. But first, we have an opportunity to worship God together via this virtual church video. There will be worshipful music, a puppet show and song for the kids. Art J will read Psalm 111. And the message from the Gospel of Mark will continue our theme of the new thing God is doing. This week the focus is on authority. Whose authority do we follow in life and where will it lead us? I'm glad you've joined us and I look forward to seeing you at our annual meeting. But let us now worship God. I greet you this morning from the beautiful sanctuary of the Huguenot Memorial Church in Pelham Manor, New York. I'm grateful to Catherine Jones, the Director of Music Ministries here, and the Church for allowing me to record for you today. The instrument you're going to hear is by a Dutch builder, the Adama Organ Builders. This instrument was completed in 2016, but sadly, right after its completion, work was being done on the tower, some power washing, and water came in and flooded one of the main chests. It took well over a year to finish the restoration. I'm happy to say the organ is back and sounding quite magnificent. I've tried to choose music that will suit this instrument, and so we will begin and end with Felix Mendelssohn. From his fourth organ sonata, you're going to hear for the prelude a beautiful allegretto, and then we're going to end with a boisterous allegro maestoso. Our school of voces is back to sing Palestrina's Sigu Cervus. Finally, the hymn I chose is number 307 from the Glory to God hymnal, a very familiar hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory to the tune Cum Randa. I hope you enjoy today's selections.
George. I thought you were expecting Lily, weren't you? Lily's gone. She's on vacation with her family. She could have waited one more week till this series was over, but no. Her dad wanted to take the whole family to Disney World. I used to get real scared whenever Lily left home. I was all alone under the bed, and I was so afraid of everything. But not anymore. Thanks to Lily, I got to know Jesus. Jesus is God's son, and he loves us. He loves you, and you, you, and you, and you. But not you, though. Uh, I'm just kidding. He totally loves you. So, hmm. <clears throat> this book here is Lily's, but she lets me borrow it. It taught me that Jesus loves me. It says that if I love Jesus and make him my savior, he will send the Holy Spirit. Some Bibles call him a Holy Ghost, which sounds scary, but it's not. The Holy Spirit is God's presence in my heart. I have Jesus in my heart, and now I am never alone. It isn't always fun being left alone. I miss having Lily to talk to. But the truth is, even when she's gone, I am never alone. I have Jesus, and Jesus will never leave me. If you don't know Jesus as your friend, you should get to know him today. And if you do know Jesus, why aren't you telling your friends? Jesus loves everyone, and he doesn't want any of us to feel lonely. Well, I guess this is goodbye, kids. I'll miss you too, but don't worry. I won't be alone. Jesus will be right here under the bed with me, and we'll both be fine. So as long as we don't hit our heads on the bed frame. Mm. Bye! Our God is in charge, and our God is an awesome God. Today, um, Art J, who often accompanies for the children's choir, will be reading the psalm. So kids, after you sing the song, listen to Art J and see if you can find when he says, Holy and awesome is his name, talking about God. The song we're going to sing, many of you know. Our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. It comes from the 80s. It was contemporary then. Now it's just kind of a nice folk tune. So why don't you sing with me once you pick it up? I'll do it several times. <laughs> Our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Good morning. This morning's psalm reading is Psalm 111, verses 1 through 10. It is a psalm composed by King David and praises God for his wonderful works. Listen to the word of the Lord as written in Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works by giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. 
They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. No one can tell me what to do. We've heard that expression many times in the last year in this country as we've battled this pandemic. The authorities tried to tell us to wear masks to slow the spread of the disease, and yet many people turned that into a matter of personal freedom. There were scenes of shoving matches and worse in stores and other public places as people refused to wear a simple mask because someone in so-called authority told them to. This refusal to accept the authority of the government over matters of personal hygiene or public health is perhaps why we have had a worse time with the coronavirus here in the United States than in almost any other country. We are well on our way to 450,000 deaths in a little over one year more than the number of men and women of service who were killed in all the years of combat of World War II. We will probably surpass the casualty totals of the Civil War before this pandemic is over. By contrast, South Korea, one of the countries that had an outbreak before we did, has had a tiny fraction of the infections and deaths we have had per capita. With a population of over 50 million, they have had fewer than 1,500 deaths total. And they are upset that they have had a recent spike 
in infections of a few hundred, taking them to 170,000 total infections in the last year. Well, our numbers are 30 to 40 times higher than theirs, and our population is only seven times higher. What's the difference? I may be over, oversimplifying, but there is a greater acceptance of authority in many Asian cultures. Mask wearing was universal in South Korea. Contact tracing was mandatory and very invasive by American standards. And yet they accepted it all without rebelling against the restrictions of their personal freedom. I was raised in Alberta, Canada, a place I often jokingly refer to as the Texas of Canada. It has an economy like Texas based on ranching and oil, and it has a fiercely independent streak in the culture. When seat belts were first becoming mandatory, Albertans refused to wear them. The Alberta government dragged its feet as long as it could on requiring them because they knew it was going to be a tough sell with their people. Well, now we all buckle up without giving it a second thought. We've gotten it through our thick skulls that seatbelts save lives. And so do masks. We just don't like someone else having the authority over us to tell us to wear them. Our gospel story today is about authority. The crowds that witnessed the encounter Jesus had with a demon-possessed man, they were impressed with the way he spoke with authority. The people liked it, it seems, but the religious authorities were naturally threatened. Listen now as I read the next scene from this opening chapter of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he had taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's interesting to note that there are three different reactions to Jesus' authority in this story. There are the people or the crowd, and it includes the disciples who traveled with Jesus, as, as well as the audience that gathered that day in the synagogue at Capernaum, the group that is described as they. They were astounded at his teaching. There's another group who are not mentioned specifically, but their presence and reaction is implied. These are the religious authorities. The narrator of the passage tells us that Jesus taught as one with authority, not like the scribes. The scribes were, of course, the clergy of the day. They were supposed to be the learned ones. And they would have been in the room that day, hearing all of this in the synagogue. But their teaching is described as weak, in comparison to that of Jesus. It's not hard to imagine their reaction. And the third audience is the demon-possessed man, and more precisely the demon or demons, plural, within him. They recognized Jesus' authority and reacted accordingly. So let's take a moment to compare the reactions to Jesus' authority from these three groups. First, the unclean spirits or the demons. Demon possession is a common issue in the Gospels. High on the list of miracles performed by Jesus are casting out of demons and unclean spirits. Scholars now believe what was called demon possession was probably mental illness in most cases. 
someone having a psychotic episode can certainly sound demon-possessed. While we don't know exactly what was going on for this man, for the purposes of this story, there were many demons who had taken possession of this man, and they had taken all authority over his life. But when they encounter Jesus, these unclean spirits know they have met their match, and then some. They recognize who he is, and they are afraid. They do what they are told out of fear and respect. They hate Jesus for his authority, but they know he has it, and so they do not argue. They're gone. The second group also recognizes authority, but they do not want to acquiesce to it. As we will see elsewhere in the gospel, the religious authorities begin to plot to destroy Jesus. Like the demons, they were afraid of Jesus and his authority, but unlike the demons, they wanted to stand their ground and take him on. They wanted to get rid of him and get back to the way things were. This is a pretty typical human reaction, maybe even an American reaction. The analogy to what happened in Washington a couple weeks ago is obvious. The authorities were telling them that their leader had lost. They did not want to accept that authority, and many of them began a long time before that event to plot to remove that authority and put back things the way they were. We simply don't like it when authority is used to challenge our worldview or threaten our comfort zone. And then finally, there is the crowd, the people who were following Jesus and listening to him. Many came to believe in him and sought to follow him and his teachings. They willingly accepted his authority. In fact, they found it reassuring. To surrender to authority you can trust is a great way to build a life with security and confidence. Our theme through January has been the new thing God is doing. Today we recognize that when God calls us to renewal, God does so with authority. And you and I are challenged by this story to reflect on our attitude towards authority. We don't talk about authority much in the church these days. There was a time when Christianity was seen as a list of do's and don'ts that came down to us from on high. I grew up with lots of those rules. We were not to smoke or drink, and when I was real young, we were not even to go to movies. The authority for those rules was seen to be coming from Scripture. It was said we were to be in the world, but not of the world. We were to maintain a separateness, supposedly a standard of purity. Well, there are many problems with that approach to the Christian life. It becomes easy to act holier than thou, and we followed rules on the outside, but perhaps we were bigoted and prejudiced against others on the inside. And so today we seldom talk about authority, but we should. Everyone, whether they realize it or not, are living their lives according to some sense of authority. There's some set of rules we follow in life, but what are they? If my only authority in life is my own sense of what's best for me, or is my authority science or the rule of law? Is obedience to family obligations the authority that guides my choices? As followers of Jesus, we can trust his authority. The more we surrender our lives in obedience to him, not only will we be happier and more fulfilled, but the world will be a better place. God seeks to do a new thing in us and in our church. And if we are to be a part of that new thing, we need to renew our commitment to the authority God has given us in Jesus Christ. Later today, in our annual meeting, we will elect new officers for our church, elders, deacons, and trustees. One of the ordination vows for elders and deacons and ministers, for that matter, speaks directly to authority. 
That vow is, will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and guided by the confessions? There's a nice hierarchy of authority in this vow that is very helpful to recognize. Our first allegiance is to Jesus Christ. We are to live in obedience to him and then under the authority of Scripture and guided by the confessions. This is a helpful caution against getting too legalistic about the Bible. We don't obey the Bible, we obey Jesus Christ, the totality of who he is and his message. And the scriptures point us to Jesus Christ and our book of historic confessions are a helpful, though not infallible guide on that journey. So what does a life lived in obedience to Jesus Christ look like? Is it someone who doesn't drink or party or do any worldly things? No, that's not the standard. It reminds me of the joke, what is the definition of a Calvinist? A Calvinist who's someone who lies awake at night worried that someone somewhere is having a good time. That's the Puritan side of our heritage, which is not what it means to be a follower of Jesus. A life lived in obedience to Jesus Christ means to live with love as the key. Love for God and love for neighbor. Love for self and others, including our enemies. Like mask wearing, that is an authority we don't want to accept. We want to reserve the right to hate our enemies. Another one of those ordination vows in our Presbyterian tradition is helpful here. It asks, will you in your life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? And then the final one of those vows is, in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Friends, it's time to put on our masks and fasten our seatbelts. Following Jesus and trusting his authority is going to be risky business. It's not comfortable. It's going to ask things of us that we don't want to do or give up. But if we live in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of God's word, we will live lives worthy of our calling. I've watched the evening news more during this pandemic than I usually do. One of the features on one channel is a segment called A Life Well Lived. And it is a look back at a person we lost to COVID-19 who lived a worthwhile life. They may have been actors or musicians or ordinary people, but what sets them apart always is how they gave something back. It was what they did for others that made it a life well lived. So, as I close today, I'll ask you to affirm this vow that we ask our church leaders, but it is a vow that each one of us should be willing to take. As we seek to do the new thing God wants to do through us in 2021, will you give your life in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided? By our confessions. If so, say I will with God's help. Amen. Let us pray together and as we do I want to share with you that uh, our longtime member Co Cos Procopus is gravely ill with COVID-19 and so we lift him up in prayer at this time. We'll pray for the ESP shelter program as this is our first week of the season. Uh, to take care of our homeless neighbors. So let us pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your Son. He speaks to us through Scripture as one who has authority. He calls us to follow in his footsteps. Help us to hear his voice, obey his teachings, and do your will. We come to you today asking for your peace for our brother, Cos Procopus, as he is gravely ill with COVID-19. We are so weary of this pandemic and all it has taken from us, but we are most grieved with the loss of loved ones. We ask your Holy Spirit to surround Grace and their entire family at this most difficult time. 
We also pray for the emergency shelter program and the guests we will provide meals for this week. May you keep them and our volunteers safe as they follow your lead to show love to our neighbors. We pray for our church as we move into another year of ministry. We pray we will emerge from the pandemic stronger and more committed than ever to live under your authority. We know that yours is the path that leads to life, and even life more abundant. We pray all these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, I invite you to join me wherever you are. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, God bless you. I look forward to seeing you over Zoom on our for our annual meeting at 11 today. And uh, the next Sunday, February 7th, will be... A communion Sunday and we could see you then in the circle you could pull through and uh, receive Holy Communion that way it'd be good to see you then God bless and have a wonderful day mm -hmm.